Hi, everyone. Today, I'll be talking about document classification with Neo4j. As Adam said, I'm Kenny Bastani. I'm a Neo4j developer evangelist. And so I'm going to first start out by talking a little bit about myself so you can get to know me a little bit better. So as I said, I'm a developer evangelist for Neo4j. I'm located in San Mateo. That's where our headquarters are at. Uh, my passions are machine learning and graph databases. I'm also a full stack developer. My primary languages are C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, and I'm also an aspiring creative writer. So with that said, uh, before we get to the agenda, I just want to provide a warning. Uh, what we're going to look at today is an experimental project. It's also a community project, so it's not something that Neo Technology as a company is supporting right now. So if there's any issues that you have with the extension, if you install it, please report them to me or go to the GitHub page and report an issue. Okay, so here's our agenda for today. First, I'll do an introduction to Neo4j. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Neo4j, I'll just do a quick overview of uh, the browser as well as the property graph data model. I'll do an introduction to graph-based document classification. I'll introduce you to hierarchical pattern recognition, which is an algorithm I created to uh, create a natural language parsing model from training data. Then I'll go over a vector space model from this natural language uh, parsing model uh, that I use to create a cosine similarity measure to get recommended uh, texts. Then I'll go over the unmanaged extension that I created called Graphify. And finally, I'll do a quick demo of a US presidential speech analysis demo. Okay, so let's do a quick introduction to Neo4j. So the property graph data model is what Neo4j uses to store and manage data. Here we have a graph. We see that we have a couple nodes, three. Uh, at the top, we have two people, John and Sally. And we see that John and Sally are friends with each other. We also see that John and Sally have read the book Graph Databases. So here we have some direct relationships with some types on them. So this is the basic property graph data model. So the next step is to add some key value pairs. So as you see here, we have a few nodes which have key value pairs on them. We see that the people, John and Sally, now have a name property with their name as well as an age property. Uh, we see on the relationship type friend of that we have the date that they've been friends since. We also see the date that they read the Graph Databases book, and we see that they've rated it as well. On the Graph Databases book, we see another property, Authors, which is E.M. Robinson and Jim Weber. So this is the basic property graph data model. So this is what we store in Neo4j, and this is what we query. So in a graph database, traversals are uh, very important to uh, the advantage of performance that you get over a relational database. So in this example, in this property graph data model, you can traverse from one node to another. I call it walking the graph. So if I started at John and I wanted to get all of John's friends, I would just walk the graph over to Sally. If I wanted to see all of the books that John has read, I would just walk the graph over to the graph databases book. So that's the basic idea. So how does this contrast to the relational table model? So here we have two tables, customers and accounts. We have a record, Alice, 143, and we see that Alice has three accounts. Now, if we wanted to map Alice to her three accounts, we would need a join table called customer accounts to map these records. 
So the difference here is that in a property graph, uh, you just have relationships stored as data. Here, we're having to infer the markers in the uh, foreign keys and primary keys to map over to, uh, from customers to accounts. Okay, so now let's take a look at the Neo4j browser. The Neo4j browser is a web-based command shell that allows you to simply do some admin stuff with our database. So you can actually go ahead and run Cypher queries and to visualize the results of those queries. So now let's get to the good stuff. Uh, so now I'll do the introduction to document classification. Document classification, uh, the problem is that you'd like to assign to a document uh, one or more classes. Uh, and also, you have documents that may be classified according to their subject or according to other attributes. The goal here is to automatically classify the text, the unlabeled documents, to a set of relevant classes using label training data. So I thought it'd be a good idea to go over a few use cases uh, to see why this would be an excellent tool in your tool set along with Neo4j. So the first use case that I came up with was sentiment analysis for movie reviews. So here we have a scenario where we have a movie website that allows users to submit reviews describing what they either liked or disliked about a particular movie. The problem is that the user reviews are unstructured, unstructured natural language text. So the question becomes, how do I automatically generate a score indicating whether the review was positive or negative? And a solution here, uh, if you have a document classification solution, is to train a natural language parsing model on a data set that has already been labeled in previous reviews as either positive or negative, and use that model to classify unlabeled text. The second use case I came up with was recommending relevant tags. So here we have a scenario where we have a Q&A website, for instance, Stack Overflow or Quora, that allows users to submit questions and receive answers from other users on the website. The problem that we have here is that users sometimes do not know what tags to apply their questions to in order to increase the discoverability for receiving answers. So the solution, again, is to uh, automatically recommend the most relevant tags for questions by classifying the text from uh, training data from previous questions. So for example, on Stack Overflow, uh, if I was to post a question about Neo4j, uh, and I was training a natural language parsing model on previous examples of questions that have already been answered, uh, and maybe my question was about Cypher, it would automatically recommend that tag, even if you didn't specify it to begin with. And finally, uh, my last uh, use case example here is to recommend similar articles. This is a very popular use case that people still have problems with today. So the scenario here is that we have a news website that provides hundreds of new articles a day to users on a broad range of topics. The problem becomes that the site needs to increase user engagement and time spent on the site. So maybe one of the solutions is to recommend similar articles. So here, the solution would be to train a natural language parsing model for the daily articles in order to provide recommendations for highly relevant articles at the bottom of each of the pages on the website. So 
So now let's talk about how automated document classification might work. When designing this unmanaged extension, I decided to split the supervised learning phase into three steps. So step one is to create a training data set. So here we have a set of documents, four documents, that have text inside them. Now we want to assign a set of labels that describes the document's text. So for instance, on the left, we have a document that's connected to the label X. We see at the top that we have a document that's connected to both X and Y. Now these labels describe the content of the document and they're hand labeled, meaning that they're provided by a human. From there, you're able to train a natural language par parsing model that goes ahead and automatically classifies based off of the probability distribution of words being next to each other inside each document. So the next step is to train a natural language parsing model on your training data set. So here we have a, a hierarchy of nodes, which are state machines. And what a state machine is, is a predicate. And what a predicate does is it evaluates on some input, either true or false. So in this hierarchy, we have a set of feature representations that are selected and learned using a evolutionary algorithm, which is kind of like a genetic algorithm. So these state machines, again, represent predicates that evaluate to zero or one when a text is matched. So when a text is matched, it'll activate, it'll uh, evaluate to one, which will then send that input along to the next layer. If the text didn't match and a zero resulted, then the input would not be sent along to the next layer. Finally, state machines map to classes of document that labels matched during the training phase. So here at the bottom, we have, again, the three classes. We have X, Y, and Z. We see that these predicates are attached to them because they were extracted from the training data from those classes. So finally, we have step three, which is to classify unlabeled documents. So now that you have your natural language parsing model, you can go ahead and classify based off of the distribution of uh, labels attached to the documents in the training data. So here we have an unlabeled document, which is connected to XYZ, and there's a cosine similarity measure to the right that ranks which of these classes was the most relevant to the unlabeled text. So now I'm going to talk about how I went about creating an extension in Neo4j that does this. So I call it Hierarchical Pattern Recognition, or HPR. So why I chose to go with a new method was because I wanted to use the power of a graph database to traverse through a hierarchy of nodes to evaluate on some function. So HPR is a graph-based deep learning algorithm. Again, I created it, and it learns deep feature representations in linear time, which is key. So I created the algorithm to do graph-based traversals using a hierarchy of finite state machines. And finally, I designed it to be scalable uh, in polynomial time. So I want to talk about some of the influences and inspirations behind this. So there's two guys here. We see to the left, we have Ray Kurzweil. And to the right, we have Jeff Hawkins. Now, if you're not familiar with Ray Kurzweil, uh, he is a renowned um, researcher uh, and figurehead for the artificial intelligence movement. Now, not too long ago, he released a book uh, called How to Create a Mind, where he discusses a theory called uh, Pattern Recognition Theory of Mind. And in this theory, he describes this system uh, which he uses hidden Markov models 
uh, to, to do this is to uh, recognize patterns at different uh, layers. So for instance, one of the examples that he cites is that uh, for recognizing a, uh, an image of a letter, like optical character recognition, you would first start by recognizing the very um, am ambiguous features like edges. And from there, then, you would be able to recognize something like the letter A. Now, Jeff Hawkins had a very similar theory, which he called hierarchical temporal memory, or HTM. So he also wrote a book about this, which he called On Intelligence. And he describes it as something very similar to, to Ray's idea, but it introduces the element of time. So I decided to take uh, the middle ground here and create something using a graph database that merged these two philosophies. And so I just called it hierarchical pattern recognition. So how does this work? So HPR uses a probabilistic model in combination with an evolutionary algorithm to generate hierarchies of deep feature representations. The deep feature representations are learned and associated with labels that are mapped to documents that the feature was discovered in. Then the feature hierarchy is translated into a vector space model to be used for classification on feature vectors generated from unlabeled text. So here we have an image uh, that I created of this model. So it's a, a hierarchy. And in the middle, we have a little delta. And that delta is the first layer. So in this example, I decided to use uh, binary data. But in the natural language text model, I'm actually using words. So that delta would actually represent some matching algorithm. In Graphify, I use regular expressions. And that triangle would represent a space character. And what's interesting is that when you match a space character on an article of text, you can see what words are next to that space symbol. So here to the left, you have another pattern, which was discovered based off of the probability of A0 being present next to a space. And to the right, you have a 1 where in this particular training model, you actually had a probability of one being next to the right of a space character. So this continues to go down the hierarchy, and it develops deeper and deeper levels of representation. And finally, the labels that are provided in the training phase are attached to each one of these nodes in Neo4j. And that's used to do the classification. So here's another model. So this is the algorithm that I'm using to generate the probability distribution of a pattern being present next to another pattern. So as you start at the top, you traverse down. So this pattern at the top with a regular expression matched the three inputs. So you see the nodes connected to the inputs. Those are just counts, sums on whether or not uh, a zero or a one was present either to the left or right of a pattern. And down at the bottom, you have a sum of left and right. And the pattern with the uh, highest probability of being present is then created. So you see at the bottom, the child left and child right inherits this template from the parent, but appends and mutates by adding something that should be present uh, most of the time. So a very important um, thing came up where in the first layer, if you generate too many uh, child nodes, and again, the uh, root node would be a space character. If you had a large document, you're matching every single instance of a space character. So as you go down the hierarchy, it becomes more computationally expensive 
if you have more nodes in that second layer. So for every space that's matched in a document, then you would actually have to test out the next layer each time. So I introduced something called a cost function. So when reproduction occurs after a threshold of matches has been exceeded for a feature, this cost function um, sets the threshold higher and higher. So you see the equation here that I used where you have TC, that's the current threshold that's a property on the Neo4j node. And then you have TM, which is the minimum threshold, which is arbitrary. And I chose five, which seemed to do very well. And at the bottom, you see what the cost function is. So TC divided by TM plus TC. So this slowly increases uh, the threshold so that patterns don't replicate too often. Here's a screenshot of the natural language parsing model that was created for uh, analysis on a set of documents which were the text of presidential speeches, the transcripts. So you see at the center, you have the node of the. And from of the, then you have the next layer, which is another set of nodes which extend that base pattern, but add some kind of mutation based off of the probability of something being present to the left or the right of the, of the pattern. So that's why you see the zero and one on each one of these nodes. That represents a wildcard match, which is a word. So every time it matches some piece of data or a document, that data is attached to that node. And then later on, when it does a sum on the number of data that's been attached to that node, if it exceeds the threshold, then that node will proceed to replicate. So now I'm going to try and show you a video. I'm not sure if this is going to work because it's a high definition video and we are on a webinar, but I'm going to go ahead and give it a go. So this is the natural language parsing model growing as it's training on data. So this is happening in real time. So you can see how fast Neo4j is responding to this algorithm. So what you're seeing at the center is that group patterns matching on space symbols. And it's introducing that cost function every time that it replicates. And that prevents noise and it keeps the algorithm running in linear time. So I'm gonna go ahead and let this run all the way through. There's about another minute left. So I created this visualization using a tool called UbiGraph. And that's spelled U-B-I and graph, which is a really neat tool that allows you to visualize graphs in three dimensions. I recommend that you take a look at it uh, if you want to do cool visualization, visualizations yourself with Neo4j. It's a lot of fun. So I primarily used UbiGraph when I was tweaking the algorithm. So UbiGraph allowed me to see that I needed to introduce a cost function because I would see so many nodes clustered at the center that there would be no room to add new nodes. It would be too costly, uh, too computationally expensive. Okay, so now that I've talked about HPR, let's talk about the vector space model that needs to be generated um, from this hierarchy to be able to do uh, recommendations using cosine similarity. So in order to create a vector uh, from the features in the database, you take that natural language parsing model uh, that you create in the training phase, and you turn it into something called a global feature index. So this is pretty low level inside the source code, 
And what I'm doing is I'm actually just running a cipher query to get back all of the patterns in the database. So there's 5,000 patterns, 5,000 features. I get all of those back and the, just the ID of those nodes. Now what I'm doing is I'm ordering uh, by that ID ascending because down the hierarchy you have rarer patterns and up the hierarchy you have more ambiguous patterns. Uh, features that are more likely to match in test data. So in order to devalue those ambiguous um, features, I go ahead and order just to be safe. And that's worked out really well. So from there, the global feature index, again, is a list of those internal IDs. And I go ahead and I take a article of text and I match down the feature hierarchy, each node to that text. And I pass back just a list of IDs of the nodes that match that unlabeled text. So from there, I'm able to create a two vectors. So I use the IDs that came back that match that unlabeled text, and I generate a array of zeros and ones. So in that multi-dimensional vector, having 5,000 dimensions because there's 5,000 features, at every ID that matched in the unlabeled text, I go ahead and represent that as a one in a new array in a vector with the zeros and ones of length 5,000. So in order to generate a relevance ranking, uh, and I'll go ahead and just read this quote from Wikipedia. Relevance rankings of documents in a keyword search can be calculated using the assumptions of document similarities theory by comparing the deviation of angles between each document vector and the original query vector where the query is represented as the same kind of vector as the documents. And so that's exactly what I'm doing here, but I'm not using a bag of words model. I'm actually using deep learning so word order does count. So now that I have my two vectors, the document and the query, I can go ahead and get the cosine similarity using this equation. So this generates that the cosine of theta, which is the cosine similarity. And this tells me how close one document is to another. Or for instance, how close an unlabeled article of text is to uh, other labeled articles of text. And we only need to get back one of the coordinates, in this case, the cosine of theta. So now that we have the cosine similarity, uh, it's important to note again this quote, uh, the resulting similarity ranges um, will be in the interval from negative one to zero, sorry, negative one to one. And for negative one, it means that the, feature, the text is exactly opposite of another document. When it's closer to one, it means it's exactly the same. When it's closer to zero, that means that it's neutral. So, it's either uh, has an intermediate similarity or a dissimilarity. So now that I told you how this works, I'll go ahead and quickly introduce you to Graphify for Neo4j, which is an unmanaged extension that runs within Neo4j that does uh, plug and play document classification. So Graphify is, again, a Neo4j unmanaged extension used for document and text classification using a graph-based hierarchical pattern recognition algorithm. Now here you see the link to the project repository. Uh, I know that you can't click this, but if you just go to github.com forward slash kbastani, you can find Graphify. Now I'm really looking for contributors and uh, maybe a few guinea pigs to go ahead and test this out 
uh, to go ahead and build the extension using the readme file uh, that is in the project. So you can go ahead and you can build that uh, extension and then put it into the Neo4j directory for plugins and start up the Neo4j database. From there, you have a set of endpoints uh, that you can post data to for training and test. So in the training phase, you would just pass in uh, an array of text, which would represent your documents. And then another field would be your labels, so an array of labels that describe the meaning of that text. So after doing this for a while, you'll generate a natural language parsing model in Neo4j. And from there, you're able to test on unlabeled text to see which classes or labels are most similar. So after this webinar, I'm going to uh, push an example project which identifies the author of a presidential speech, the transcript. So I originally promised a Wikipedia example, and that's still coming, but I thought this would be good for the webinar. So here are the directions to go ahead and run that example after I upload it to GitHub. So again, that example project is the United States Presidential Speech Analysis. So we're looking at the transcripts of multiple speeches from a set of presidents. And the goal here is to identify the political affiliation of a presidential speech. So in this example, it ingests a set of texts from presidential speeches with labels from the author of that speech in the training phase. So after building the training model, uh, unlabeled presidential speeches, presidential speeches are then classified in the test phase. So here are the presidents that I decided to use. So here we have five presidents in order, Ronald Reagan, uh, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama. And you see here the labels that I chose. So I decided to give Ronald Reagan the labels conservative Democrat and Ronald Reagan. And I did the same for other presidents here based off of their political affiliation. So Ronald Reagan's the only one here that actually is a Democrat but conservative, where the rest actually are in line with their party. So I generated a training data set, uh, which comprised of four transcripts of speeches for each president. And then I decided to use two speeches to test the validity of the model in the test phase. So after generating the natural language parsing model from each of the four transcripts for each of the presidents, I could then test whether or not on an unlabeled speech that the model actually worked, and it did. So I'm just going to show you the results of the similarity measure for each of the presidents. So starting with Ronald Reagan, uh, we see, of course, that we have conservative here because I provided that as a label. I also provided the Democrat label. But we can see the distance between Democrat and Republican to see maybe how much of the text in Ronald Reagan's speeches resonates with the Republican audience. And the presidents, presidents that are most like Ronald Reagan, according to their speeches, uh, would start with Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and then both of the Bushes. And I just labeled them as Bush 41 and 43, where 41 is George H.W. Bush and 43 is George W. Bush. So this looks about right. I would say that at the bottom we have uh, the Bushes, which are uh, most different from the speeches of Ronald Reagan. So now we have uh, Bush 41, which is George H.W. Bush. And we see that at the top, we have the labels that we've provided that are most similar. So we have Republican, uh, conservative, and then we see uh, Democrats. So we can see, again, how far 
away Republican is from Democrat. So we go back a slide and look at Ronald Reagan. We can actually see that George H.W. Bush had a little bit more of a leaning towards the Democratic Party, which is interesting because during his uh, presidential term, he had to he had a war, so he probably wanted to uh, appeal uh, to a bipartisan audience more. I just want to make a quick note. Um, Ronald Reagan was a Democrat before 1962, oh, <laughs> and after 1962, he was a Republican. But for the purpose of this I, exercise, I think this information still works, and we'll update it for the next round. So sorry. I, I try to stay out of politics, but I, I, so I'm more of a technologist. But um, uh, yeah, I probably should have fact checked that. But I have Adam to help me out there. Um, so two, I think the majority of our audience is European, so maybe they just went along with <laughs> Um, okay, so continuing on then. So yeah, I'll update these models when I upload the slides to SlideShare. Uh, but the uh, let's move forward to Bill Clinton. So we see that Bill Clinton um, actually, so again, has liberal and Democrat at the top, which were the labels that we provided uh, in the training phase. And then we see, again, how far away liberal is from conservative. So we see that Bill Clinton actually is closest to Barack Obama. And I guess we just have to cross off Ronald Reagan because it's not accurate. But I would actually explain the deviation um, that he had, that I was expecting from, uh, there was something off about Ronald Reagan. <laughs> uh, so that's actually a good thing. Uh, and then again, we have Bush 43 and 41 at the bottom. So now moving forward to George W. Bush, Bush 43, we see, again, Republican conservative at the top. And then we can see how far away Republican is from Democrat, which is pretty far. We see actually, too, that George W. Bush is most like Barack Obama, according to the speech transcripts, uh, which is probably accurate because uh, the the time, so the vocabulary has evolved. So the grammar is perhaps different. But what was interesting here is that um, Bush 41 was farthest away from Bush 43. So clearly, uh, Bush 43 was trying to uh, set himself apart from his father. And finally, you have Barack Obama, the current president. And again, at the top, we see the labels that we provided. And we see that he's closest to Bill Clinton. And we see that he's pretty bipartisan as well. And he's farthest away from Bush 41. So that's it. That's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed um, the webinar. Uh, I want to thank you uh, and to apologize for last week um, for delaying the webinar. I hope you enjoyed the content today. I hope you found it useful. Uh, and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Uh, and two, please go over to the uh, project repository and give it a try. So now I just want to say a few words about the Neo4j community. So if you do have any problems with Neo4j or Graphify, feel free to go over to Stack Overflow and post with a tag Neo4j or Graphify, uh, and then one of the developer evangelists or avid members of the community will provide an answer. We also have the Neo4j Google group, which has more of a form-based platform. If you have any problems with Neo4j itself, you can go and check the issues on the GitHub project repository to see if that issue has been reported, or you can report a new issue. Also, you can head over to neo4j.meetup.com to see all of our meetups worldwide. So that's it. Thank you again. And I will open up the floor to questions.